heads with me as we pray. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity that we have to hear about the wonderful work that is being done by, by ADRA, Lord, all across the world. I pray, Father, that you will be with us this morning, that you will be with our speaker, and that you will grant us all listening ears to hear what he has to say. Thank you, Father, so much. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, we have with us Douglas Pereira, and uh, he is one of the directors of ADRA, and uh, he has some wonderful news to share with us. He's going to have some great stuff, so I want to invite you to give him your undivided attention. Douglas, time is yours. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, is that a good morning? I'm just checking. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I'm so glad to be here. It's my first time at Paguash. And I'm so impressed, I tell you. And somehow, it's my first time representing ADRA in a camp meeting. And it was interesting because when we were dividing where we would go, they said, Douglas, you are going here for your first time representing ADRA, so you're going to one of the best places. And I understand why they sent me here. Beautiful campsite, wonderful people, and it is good to be here. And I tell you, I have been around in a few campsites because previously I served at It Is Written Canada, so I had been in other camp meetings and other places, but Pagwash, oh my. And I said to my wife yesterday, next year we need to come, and if possible for the full week, right, with our two kids. But today I'm so blessed to represent ADRA Canada. And by the way, anyone knows what ADRA means? What's this? Sometimes people, even hard, ADRA. Whoa, that's great. I, I know Pastor Daniel saw so be here, but we'll have a pen for you, Pastor, uh, very soon for those that answer. Sometimes I ask what ADRA means, and people say, oh, the Adventist, the, they don't get development. They usually... I choose another word. Anybody knows what word they usually say? Disaster. Disaster. That's right. Who said that? Yes. So look at, for me. I'll have a, a pen for you. Yeah, disaster. No, but we are about development. But this morning, what I want to try to do, it is a mix between what, what ADRA, our ministry, the ministry, the humanitarian ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada is doing somehow in Canada and around the world is our work. But at the same time, uh, pick some points for our quarterly and our lesson, because I think there's a lot of similarities there. So are you good uh, to do that with me? It's not a sermon. Uh, even though I'm a preacher, I'm not here to preach, so I want your participation. I want to hear from you as well. And let's have a dialogue. And we have a mic for you. I will just ask you to wait because we have some people watching from home. And we want to hear your voice as well. But the quarterly, the, the title for this week is what? Extreme Hit. And, and I, I want to confess to you what image came to my mind when I realized, okay, I'll be in Pagwash. During this week, representing ADRA, but at the same time, we need to review and go through our lesson. Uh, what came to my mind when I read the, the title, Extreme Re Heat, was about uh, my kind of teenager years. As you have perceived, I have a strong accent. And you knows, anyone knows from where I'm from originally? Who said Brazil? Okay, look for me, a pen. Oh, by the way, just this side is getting pens, Adra pens at this point, right? We have three here already. Brazil, that's right. I grew up in Brazil. My father was a preacher, a pastor, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, so I'm a PK. And 
when I went to high school, after a couple of months in high school, we live in the state, in the city of Sao Paulo. I don't know if I have heard. We have on the great Sao Paulo, 20 million people. It's just concrete. Okay, it's just buildings, pollution, right? That was my life from growing up until the teenager. But my father was invited to pastor and do a missionary work in a state called um, Mato Grosso, the province of Mato Grosso. And somehow, and you see it's kind of northwest of Brazil, um, it's a very well known in Brazil for a few things. Just below here, as part of two states, we have what we call Pantanal. We, are, we hear a lot about the Amazon forest, but Pantanal is so beautiful. So imagine a kid leaving Sao Paulo and going and exploring Pantanal. I would see some pictures like that, right? By the way, that time we didn't have cameras or cell phones, right? So I had to borrow from someone, right? And what do you see a lot there? There are farms of alligators. So people would go for fishing, right? And you see the animals, the alligators, right? It was beautiful. A little bit north of Pantanal, even close to Amazon forest, we have what we call uh, the uh, National Park of uh, um, Chapada dos Guimarães, and it's a beautiful site with uh, many beautiful nature sites, right? Um, so beautiful. Caves, we have many caves, the water for those caves. And I remember going in the weekends, bicycling, 40 kilometers to those sites with my friends, right? The water, you just swim with the fishes. So imagine a kid from living in a condo apartment, just concrete. I never seen so much in my life going to this place for mission and for missionary work. And we lived there for four years. But there's something that that state is very well known. It is the hottest place in Brazil. Right? The average is 49 degrees. See, I mean, what you're seeing is, uh, is positive, okay? It's not negative. I was in Saskatchewan, and I come in, I'm coming from Saskatoon. I was pastoring there, and it was interesting because I was calling a friend from Brazil, one of my best friends, and I said, hey, how's the weather there, right? Because here in Saskatoon, ah, it's 40 below, and he sent me this picture on WhatsApp. Hey, look what is here. 51 degrees. And I was looking what was the highest um, uh, temperature last year in Cuiabá, the capital of the state, and was 58. I would call that extreme heat. And please don't tell that to my father, okay? Do you know what we would do as a kids as one was very hot? We would fry eggs on the asphalt. And sometimes we'll prank people and we'll put eggs on the cars and you see the egg being fried. <laughs> But that's not the extreme heat that we are talking about here, right? What kind of heat is the lesson, the quarterly, talking about? I want to hear from you. Anyone? What, what is the, that extreme heat that we are talking about? Pastor, please. It's talking about trials. It's talking about difficulties in life. Misery. I hear you. Trials. And talk about trials. Let me share with you someone that I do believe went to uh, extreme heat. I'll play a video right now. So just for you to be aware for the...
We didn't think that we were hungry or we couldn't take shower because there were no hot water. We just were thinking about uh, are we going to stay alive today or are we going to die? And we were only praying all the time and thanks God we are still alive. I'm Ruslana, I'm staying here in Poland at the church. Well, my family are refugees from Ukraine. My mom, my siblings, sister and brother. Unfortunately, our father, he's a preacher and he's left in Ukraine. When the first day of war started, we hoped it will end soon, but it didn't. And the worst part was that our city, Bryansk, was occupied on the second and third days of war. So just from the start and we couldn't leave the city at all and the pharmacies the food stores were completely empty people couldn't buy food or even like simple medicines and also we didn't have any network or we couldn't even call that we are alive and our grandmother she was so worried and we couldn't tell her that we are alive it was so bad The majority of us don't have relatives or friends here and the only people who help is church. The church gonna give us a chance to have future and help us with the basic things. And here's a bedroom, so we slept here. And it's quite comfortable, it's warm here and nice. And we are really glad that church provided us a place to sleep in. Jesus never asked, who are you? What is your nationality? Are you a good person or a bad person? He was open. And I think this is a good example for us. When we are helping others, it's like Jesus' hands will be through us. We change because of Jesus, of his impact on us. And we want to be his hands. We want to be his feet. A global humanitarian agency, ADRA, which is the Venice Development and Relief Agency, ADRA, based here in Internacional, que es la rama humanitaria de la Iglesia Adventista del Séptimo Día. Es adventista que recursos asistenciales. Right now, the organization has people in and around Ukraine helping the hundreds of thousands of people flee. The groups here at home are getting involved as well. The Maryland Aid Group is going much farther, 5,000 miles farther, to provide direct help. It's already providing shelter to refugees in youth centers and church buildings. And her volunteers cross the border themselves into Ukraine with this convoy carrying supplies. When they said, like, don't worry, you can feel like at home here and we will help you because we are your brothers and sisters in God. They just supported us and that meant so much. It is that at extreme heat, yes or no? There's a philosopher that says that life is somehow can be defined by problems or challenges. Or you are coming from a challenge, a problem in your life. Or you are in a problem. Or you are going towards a problem. And somehow, I think that's one of the main lessons and points that we are taking, studying the quarterly. This, um, this time is suffering is a present reality in our following world. And as Christians, we must learn to deal with suffering and to learn from it. It's not easy. But the reality is... That I know that many of you maybe are going through a problem right now. An extreme heat season in your life. 
And maybe you're not, but there are other brothers and sisters around the world, like in Ukraine, that they are going through that season. And for me, it's so beautiful to know that the love of Christ is shown to them by the work that you and I do to other Canada. I'll be in Ukraine at the end of uh, September. I'm going to Ukraine, Moldova, and Romania, visiting the sites and planning for the development. We are agents of relief. It's an emergency. We are doing, before even the war started, ADRA International, our network, start planning what we're supposed to do. And one thing that we did in Ukraine, that, and that was so beautiful, we ordered buses. And we got even funds from other organizations, and we have more than 25 buses right now. And you know what those buses do? They take people from the heat places and move them to the border. And in each country around Ukraine, guess what you have? Adra, our brothers and sisters. All our churches became a refugee place, a sanctuary for the cast out, for the widow, for those in pain and suffering. I, I don't know if I can say that, but I'm proud to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church family and Adra in a sense that we are providing, but there's so much to do. But here on our quarterly, we are talking about an extreme heat. And, and he talks about, he, he chose a few stories from the Bible. But our memory verse comes from Isaiah 53, 10. Anyone would like to read this Bible verse for us? And you can read from your Bible. I have here on the screen, if you want as well, from the New King James Version. But... Uh, who would like to read for us our memory verse? Um, because this memory verse talks about extreme heat that someone would suffer. Who be willing? And maybe a lady. Oh, thank you. Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Hmm. To whom this Bible verse is talking about here? Jesus went through extreme heat. Is that right? And just a side note here about this Bible verse. Uh, one of my hobbies and passions is to visit uh, the land of the Bible. Um, and I have been, I think, in Israel 10 times. Sometimes taking people, teaching there. And I remember one time I was flying, and who was beside me? A rabbi. I was flying, I think, from New York to Tel Aviv, Israel, and I was a rabbi beside me. And then he asked me, okay, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I am a pastor, a Christian pastor. And look, oh, really? Yeah, I studied the Torah. And he, oh, you call Torah? Yes, the Bible, yeah. But all about the New Testament. I said, for me, I understand that's part of the Bible. Oh, I, I disagree with that. I said, no, that, that, there's no problem. And we start talking. And he looked at me and said, you know what? You look a smart preacher. Let me ask you, why do you believe in that person called Jesus Christ? And he starts saying why Jesus was just an a invention. Someone that we should not surrender our lives to. And I said to him, do you have your Bible with you? Do you have your Torah? And he got his Hebrew Bible. I say, sorry, I will not be able to read in Hebrew. I have my English one. Can we read together? I say, yeah. 
So let me ask you, do you mind to turn to the prophet Isaiah, chapter 53? And let's read together. And then we start reading together. Isaiah 53, we read this Bible verse and then ask him. So tell me, how do you see the fulfillment of this prophet? Who is this person that went to this extreme heat? He looked at me and he said, you know what? I'm kind of tired. Let's go to, I'll have a nap. And his name was Solomon. I remember until Rabbi Solomon. But Jesus Christ went through extreme heat. And for me, that's so powerful in so many ways. And one of them is when I go through those seasons, I know that my Savior can relate to that because he went through heat seasons. And much extreme seasons than I. He can relate to us. And that's so beautiful. But, um, and I think the main thought of our lesson for this week, and you may agree or not, is this quote here. The fact that God exposes us to extreme heat may move us to doubt his fair and loving character. We must not doubt God's motivation, even if we don't understand it. We cannot doubt his love, his protection, and care. And the Bible and the quarterly mentioned about three main stories to talk about that. The first one was what? Abraham. The second one, Hosea. And the third one, Job. And I think we could see many other stories in the Bible of people that went through extreme seasons of hate. But let me ask you, what are major lessons that you take as you think, look at the life of those men and women that went through these extreme hits? In their life. What's your takeaway from this study of this week? Anyone like to, to share with us some of your thoughts? Just one, not everybody. Okay. Fast, okay. Just 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 a moment so the mic can get to you. Thank you. They all grew exponentially as a result of the extreme heat. They all experienced tremendous growth. Wow. It's a way that God develops and makes our faith and character to develop and grow. Uh, any other person would like to give an input about it? What is one lesson that you take about extreme heat seasons from this uh, characters of the Bible. I had a question. Yes. They seem to be good people, like faithful to God, obedient, and still they have to go for this trouble. Um, it's, uh, you know, why? Mm. Why? That's a question for many books, many lectures and considerations, right? And it's very interesting that sometimes we have this idea. And it's not just an idea that we have today. We have even in the biblical times. And I'll pass the microphone just a second to you. But remember when uh, Jesus and his disciples were walking... And they saw a blind man. I think it's uh, John chapter 9, or if I'm not wrong. And, uh, and the disciples ask, who sin? Was their parents, his parents, or was his own sins? We sometimes connect suffering to what? Sin. 
That is the dialogue of Job. The book of Job. Like, Job had some friends. And I tell you, Job had great friends. The best friends ever. If you go to Job chapter 2, the end of the chapter, you see that when the friends saw Job, the Bible said that they sat and they cried for how long? Seven days. Have you have come to a friend that just came and cried with you for seven days? Job had those. But the problem, and was a theological problem of the Job's friends, is, Job, you're suffering. Probably there is a reason. Probably there's a sin. And there's now four dialogues in the book of Job trying to, his friends saying, I need to prove to you that you did something wrong, and that's the reason you're going to a suffering season. And Job is defending his character. No, I have not done. I, I don't deserve that. And there's this dialogue. And, and, and it's basically a, a dialogue about a wrong understanding about suffering. That suffering necessarily is connected to sin. Or as is a, God is correcting me. God is punishing me. God is teaching me a lesson. But not all the suffering happens to that. And as you mentioned, they were good. And I think more important, what, what is the reason? What's the source of suffering? Because the Bible presents many sufferings, many sources of suffering or problems. The devil, the sin problems, what we, what we plant, right? It's what we harvest. Another source is other people. Like I'm driving, there's someone that is drunk, is driving, hits my car. Am I responsible? What is my sin there? No, it's another person's responsibility that made that happen. So there's many sources of suffering. But I think more important, what is the source, what is bringing to my life, is to understand what God is capable to do through that suffering. How he used that to shape me more like God. On my last church where Pastor Dave's and Cindy's granddaughter was a member, I did a series called In God's Kitchen. And every sermon I would cook a dish. And the idea was we'll have surprise ingredients. And from those ingredients, I had to come up with a dish. And I, I, the analogy was that God has a kitchen. And no matter the ingredients that we're throwing to him, he at the end will make a beautiful dish out of that. So more important to understand the source, the reason why, is to understand what God is doing and where he's leading us. And sometimes God allows us to shape our contribution for the kingdom. You had a comment. You answered that very well. <laughs> uh, two two uh, things I get from that. One is sometimes we need to see something in ourselves that's missing, something that's lacking in our own experience. So we have to go through some experiences to learn about ourselves. The other part is that experience can learn in, teach us more about what God is like and how much he loves us. Mm. It's, it's about God and us. It's a relationship thing. It's, it's how God relates to us and how we need to learn more about what he's like. Amen, amen, amen. Let me share with you uh, extreme heat that is ahead of us. You may not be aware or you might be aware. Have you heard about the hunger crisis? And I just saw yesterday the cover of The Economist, the coming food catastrophe. And especially the Horn of Africa, like where 70% of their grains and food comes from Ukraine and Russia. The inflation. Like we have a, a project of feeding people Yemen. Yemen is the, most, is the 
most terrible humanitarian crisis right now happening. And Anita, that is our emergency international director, she came to my office and she said, Douglas, we have a problem. It's like, Houston, we have a problem. Douglas, we have a problem. Because of the inflation, because of the war, not having enough rain in some parts of the world, because of these and that, the oil price, just for us to keep feeding the same amount of people in Yemen, we need an extra $300,000. And I'll, I'll show a video of one minute right now. And this video was running two weeks ago. But I decided to play because that gives a perspective about this extreme heat that we are going towards. So pay attention. ADRA urgently needs your help to save lives in the current food shortage crisis. The cost of food around the world is higher than it has ever been. The World Food Program estimates that right now, 345 million people are experiencing food insecurity, and of that number, 50 million are in crisis. Ethiopia, Somalia, and South Sudan are experiencing famines. COVID, climate change, and the war in Ukraine have disrupted supply chains that import food, fertilizer, and fuel to areas that need them the most. This is where you come in. The Canadian government has announced a plan to match donations made through Canada's humanitarian coalition up to a maximum of $5 million. As a member of this coalition, ADRA is asking Canadians to give generously to this cause. Donate through ADRA between June 15 and July 17, 2022, and the Canadian government will match your donation dollar for dollar. Your generous gift will relieve suffering and save lives. Thank you for supporting the fight against hunger. I know that was dated, but we'll have another videos coming up for the fall. Millions of people by September will not be able to have at least one meal a week. Not a day, a week. Look this story from Venezuela. My name is Rosemary. I am a single mother and I have six children. One lives with my mother and the rest live with me here in a rented room. Things are very difficult for us. We don't have much space. We all sleep together on one bed. I have not been able to pay my rent now for many months, and my landlord wants us out. I keep telling him that we have nowhere else to go. He has taken off our door, and we are exposed to the elements with no security. There are so many holes in our roof that we get soaked whenever it rains. A friend of mine used to look after my children when I was away at work every day, but now she is gone and my children are left alone. The older boys try and find odd jobs to make a little money. I take my baby with me to work. My day starts at 4 a.m. I work selling vegetables and seasonings in a market that is a long walk from my home. Since I have no money to buy vegetables, I need to first borrow money from a money lender. I do my best to sell as much as I can, but there are many other women in the market who are also selling the same vegetables. Some days I make a profit, and other days I do not. In my country, inflation is a big problem. Sometimes the dollar has gone up so much in just one day that between that and the lender's fees, I owe much more than I borrowed at the beginning of the day. This means that some days I am able to bring food home to my children, and other days I am not. ADRA has saved my life. They were a real answer to my prayers. Every night I cried out to God. I pled with Him to see me, to see my children and send us help. That is when ADRA came. They have been such a big help to me and my family. It has been such a blessing. They have provided food and other support. I am so grateful for what ADRA has done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <sighs> One
one point that I wanna, probably the last point that I wanna highlight from our quarterly, our study for this week. And it's very interesting why the author didn't focus on the three, Daniel's friends, right? They face extreme heat. And I was considering and praying about and reflecting. And I remember um, on my previous church, we did a year of studying Daniel. I preached 42 sermons on Daniel. Not focusing only the prophets, but the lifestyle and the lessons. And I remember struggling as I was preparing a couple of messages from Daniel chapter 3. Because we love to tell the stories of those three men that went to the furnace and they came out alive. Isn't that beautiful? Powerful? But let me ask you, is that the case for everyone? And I would say, that was the exception. Because I even, I was trying to find on my hard drive, but I couldn't, a picture of where John Huss, he was born alive. He faced the fire. And he died. So as I was telling my congregation, I said, okay, what should I tell them? Should I just say, yeah, don't worry, you come alive, you survive. Can I guarantee that? And for me, and that was the point of my message at that time, was the miracle was not those three men coming alive from that fire. The miracle was that God himself was there with them in that fire. And that miracle, I can tell you that everyone here can expect. Because during the fiery seasons, no matter the outcome, God is with us. God is with you. And that is the miracle of the extreme heat. That you are not alone. God is with you. That may burn, but God will be with you. And that is the miracle that we need to hold on. And that is what God has promised us. Anyone would like to read for us Psalm 23, 4? And maybe you know by heart this Bible verse. But I would love to hear someone talk, reading this Bible verse, reciting this Bible verse. Psalm 23, verse 4. And I want to get the microphone to you. So who will be willing to read this Bible verse? Let me see a hand. We have here a brother. Just a second. And if you don't have this Bible verse highlighted in your Bible, please do that. Psalm 23, verse 4. <clears throat> Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. Do you mind to read again, again one more time? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We will walk, and we might walk on the valley, but we are not by ourselves. God is with us. And there's another Bible verse that I want to encourage you, maybe you to uh, read later, Isaiah 43, and I know our lesson mentions specific verse 2 to 4, uh, 2 to 4, yes, is very special. Where this assurance again, the miracle that God is with us during the fire. But let me make one more point here. And somehow I'm coming to a conclusion of my thoughts and maybe open for some questions about Adra. And it's good to see my good friend Daniel that may help me answer some of those questions. Um, what is one of the main ways that God can be with us during the seasons of extreme heat? 
What is a way that God manifests himself to give us support during, during this time of extremely heat seasons? I heard something. Friends. People. The main way that God uses to be with us during the seasons, and that's what I humbly believe, is sending people to be with us during these seasons. It's someone that comes after a prayer. It's a call. It's someone that knocks at your door. And you can see God intervention, divine appointment through that people. And I just looking at two people here in special. Pastor Dave, your president. I remember going through a very difficult season in my ministerial work. And that man would call me at least once a week to pray with me. I didn't see Dave. I, I see God with me in the fire. Thank you, Dave. I love you, man. And I was so blessed to hear that was coming here. God was with Dave. And as Dave was with me, God was with me. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you see the point? And another person that I want to point out, it's our lovely Pam and Mike's wife. I went through a different difficult season in my life that took me from Canada back to Brazil. And that lady went to visit my family twice in Brazil. When I saw and I went to the airport to pick up Pam, I was picking up God. Because God was using her to encourage my family and provide support. My point. God is with us during extreme seasons of heat. And one of the main ways that he is with us is through what? People. Others. And here, my main thought for you. You can be that person. You can be God for other people. And you have been through the service and ministry of Adra. I'm new at Adra. I started in February 15. But you don't realize how much I appreciate seeing the support, the money that I was sending, the prayers, and I was involving even in mission trips, understanding that God is using me, and now in special my ministry, to be in the hitting seasons of many people around the world, in Ukraine, Africa, Asia, South America, here in Canada. Talk with Pastor Daniel that leads our national, our Canadian program, how God has been using you. Because Adra is not that ministry over there, our cousin, far away that we see once a year asking for money. Adra is your ministry. It's the love of God in practice that belongs to you. You should be proud what we are doing around the world and here in Canada. Adra is your ministry. And you should know about that. Adra is God for many people during their hit seasons. And here's a short report of what you have been doing and how you have been God for many people during this season of fire. ADRA 
is the humanitarian arm of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. With an established office presence in over 120 countries, ADRA is well positioned to act immediately when emergencies or disasters happen. Through the connections that our offices have with local Adventist church members, ADRA is able to quickly assemble a volunteer force that is ready to implement life-saving assistance to the survivors of natural and man-made calamities. Over the last year, ADRA Canada, through your support, has served communities devastated by typhoons, earthquakes, volcanoes, wildfires, and war. Fleeing their homes at a moment's notice leaves people helpless and vulnerable. ADRA responds with Christian love and compassion, providing water for the thirsty, food for the hungry, clothing for those in need, protection and shelter for the refugee, care for the sick, and psychosocial support for those in prisons of trauma and despair. In Yemen, a country torn apart by war for eight years, you have fed the hungry and provided critical medical care to families facing what is being labeled as the world's worst humanitarian crisis right now. In the ongoing war in Ukraine, you are providing essential supplies to refugees fleeing across the border and families displaced within Ukraine. Your support is giving people the means to buy the most needed supplies. It provides them with shelter, food, and protection. One of the greatest disasters that ADRA works with every day is the slow tsunami of global poverty. Compounded by the stressors of COVID-19 and rapid inflation, more people live under a depressing and life-threatening cloud of poverty today than there have been in many years, even here in Canada. The ministry and mission of ADRA is to serve humanity so all may live as God intended. With justice, compassion, and love, we work to restore individuals, families, and communities to the health and wholeness that God intended for them. Through the Bright Project, your support is dramatically changing the lives of children by providing opportunities for them to return to and finish school. In Myanmar, Niger, and Sudan, countries plagued with internal conflict, young girls are now back in school, pursuing their dreams. Yesterday, they faced the bleak prospect of becoming a child bride. Today, because of ADRA's Bright Project, the doors of opportunity have opened wide. Last year, the Government of Canada extended their trust in ADRA by approving funding assistance for over $27 million for a project to serve vulnerable communities in Cambodia, Kenya, the Philippines, and Uganda. Your support of the Ministry of ADRA helps us meet our contribution agreements for these kinds of extensive projects. Over the next six years, the TOGETHER project will save lives and promote better health and opportunities for people living in extreme poverty. Over the last year, your kind gifts also relieved suffering right here at home. In partnership with the Ministries of Compassion projects conducted by Adventist churches across Canada, you and ADRA are serving neighbors in need. 
The fire season in British Columbia in 2021 was one of the worst on record. Because of your timely response, ADRA, local churches, and the British Columbia Conference were able to support evacuees with hot meals, shelter, food, and in-kind donations management. After devastating floods in B.C. filled homes with mud and waste, ADRA partnered with church volunteers from Abbotsford and Merritt to help vulnerable residents clean and restore their homes. In 2021, your support directly reached almost 900,000 people around the world and in Canada. Through 46 different projects in 26 countries, you have shared God's transformational love and care with those in need and changed their lives for the better. Hi, I'm Steve Matthews, Executive Director for ADRA Canada. As we bring this video report to a close, I wanted to come in and offer a personal word of thanks for your support over the last year. We have all faced unique challenges this past year, and yet, even through these difficult times, your support of ADRA has increased. We are so encouraged by your faithful giving. We truly could not do this work without you. Together, we are making known God's true character of justice, compassion, and love to the most vulnerable around the world and here at home. May God bless you and guide you, protect and keep you through another year. Thank you so much for supporting the ministry of ADRA. Thank you. Thank you for being God for many people during their tough season. Just thank you. And I want to encourage you to pray. Pray for those that are suffering. Pray for those that will be facing in many challenges, as I mentioned about the hunger crisis coming. Pray for the other works. And I tell you, I think we need to pray that prayer that Jesus did in Luke 9. Pray for new workers because the harvest is big. We need more people. Pray. Get involved. Get involved in your local communities. Pastor Daniel, and talk with him. He has great plans, ideas, and support. Get involved in your church. Your church can make the difference where you are. And get involved with the work of ADRA Canada, our ministry, that reaches to other countries and here. Need your support volunteers, and financial, financial May God bless you abundantly. But before I finish this report, I just want to offer a special prayer. A special prayer for those that maybe are facing a extreme heating season of, on their life. We are talking about people suffering, people despair, but maybe we have here on this auditorium someone that needs to feel God, to experience God right now because it's too much. It is a burden. And I don't want to leave without giving you the opportunity to feel the love of God through our support and prayer. So let me ask you, is there someone here that needs a special prayer and asking God 
to be with you during this season of fire in your life? Is there one person that needs a special prayer right now? I want to invite you to come here if you don't mind. Because I want to pray for you. And I saw some hands. If you're comfortable, please come here. And I may invite our president, Pastor David, and other pastors that are here. Pastor Daniel, I see. I saw Pastor Ivaldo as well. And the local pastors. Oh, sorry, I don't know all your names. But because I want to pray for those fine people that need a special prayer during their season of extreme suffering and challenges. And Pastor Daniel, if you don't mind, I'll ask you to, to offer this prayer for us, my dear colleague from Adra, Canada. But I want to give opportunity to one more person or two, if necessary, to come for this special prayer. We don't know what you're going through, but you're not alone. God is with you. And more than that, we are with you. Pastor Daniel, please. Thank you so much, Pastor Doug. Here we've gathered on this beautiful Sabbath to give thanks to God and offer a special prayer. Will you join me in prayer this day? Blessed Heavenly Father, we stand before you, O Lord, on these sacred grounds of Camp Pugwash, this place that you provided for camp meeting, for this conference, Lord, a place, O oh Lord, that we can experience your presence, your peace, and your power. As we look, O oh Lord, on the beauties of nature, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows your handiwork. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We want to thank you for all of the dedicated members, pastors, teachers, leaders, ministrators of this conference. Especially, we thank you for the message today through your son, your servant, your messenger, Pastor Doug, reminding us that you are with us during those extreme heat seasons, during the fires of our lives. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with us. Because all things are but a shadow in your presence. There are those who have responded to the call today. Lord, the truth is we all need a touch from the Master. We all need your divine hand to be placed upon us. We've been going through difficulties, Lord. Uh, storms, as during, especially during this past pandemic, has affected us in so many ways. Psychologically, emotionally, physically, socially, financially, and even spiritually. But we thank you that there is still a God in heaven who neither slumbers nor sleeps, a God who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, a God who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so for those who have come, we ask that you will meet us here today because you are Emmanuel, God with us. So I pray that you'll stretch your hand of healing. Touch us, Lord, at our point of need. There are those who need healing, Lord. Those who need your divine intervention. Those who are struggling in so many ways. Even the doctors can't understand. But we thank you that you are the great physician. So may your healing hand touch each one here today. And especially those who are standing, O oh Lord, who have come forward in a special way, Lord. You know them by name, need, and nature. May you reach them, Lord, because you're God, and with you, nothing is impossible. Amen. Bless each one now in a special way. May we experience your healing, renewing, regenerating grace, O oh Lord, that this Sabbath day will be one that will be different, Lord, that when we leave this place, we can say we have been with Jesus. We've had an encounter with the man from Galilee and we can never be the same again. Bless all your people here today. Those who are on their way, bring them here safely. May this be a great final and high Sabbath on this camp meeting of 2022. 
And keep us near the cross. Keep us faithful to you as we see the day approaching. And use us as your instruments for your honor and glory that through us we will be a blessing to others. Please hear and answer our prayer this day for we ask it in the almighty name of the Father, in the name of the only begotten Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit with thanksgiving that every child of God say, Amen. Amen. And amen. May God bless you. going to have a break until 11 o'clock where we will uh, go into our midday service so you can use the facilities get some water refreshments what have you and we will reconvene here at 11 o'clock 11 o'clock Gary's choice is let's talk about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs>
Have we got? Let's talk about it. I think it's. I think it's in the blue. Let's talk. The blue country. That's an oldie, but a goodie. Do you know that one, Alita? Oh no, it's not. It's in the blue. Here's our song. I think it might be. I think it's in that one there. that we all talk over the top of each other and make it hard for you. <laughs> but we have so much fun in this group. Timing up, gotta stick with her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, well, actually, it's Rock of Age. Oh no, we were. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I yeah, finally yeah. got it right. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Alita I share a memory. music test the other year. <laughs> Goodness, it was years ago. Three years oh, ago. Was it, yeah. She got 15 out of 15. And there were clefs that I'd never seen in my life. Not just treble and bass clef. Was it an alto clef? Alto. C, C, C clef. The alto clef, tenor clef, yeah. baritone clef. Well, they, clef. Both they both clef. know. They both know. They both know. In the white clips of day. She got 15 out of 15. I thought I'd have a little turn. I got eight. <laughs> I don't know the rock of ages clip. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll just keep on singing. <laughs> it's all good, yeah. yeah. Music's not yeah, enough. very good. So no, what was the one that Belinda yeah. suggested? And then Sonia, you jumped in and said, yes, that one. Oh, he's everything to me. We'll Lynn, yeah, talk it over. We've got to do everything for it, me. We'll do it. Mm. Was it We'll In Talk It Over? Mm. It only takes us far too. Well, we're doing He's Everything to Me. <laughs> Put it in again, Sonia.
Praise God for the Sabbath sing-alongs. Mm. Oh, Hovid, I would never have picked up that song again. Mm. It was this yeah. group and it was used to just starting yeah. it. I was like, what is that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Love that song. Bringing it back in the... the dark recesses oh. of the mind. Yes. Okay, yes, we'll talk it over. Definitely, that was in there. Number 78 in... You know, Jesus, what a wonder you are. In country, yeah. Like in US, yeah. 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 I think we started in C and then went to D, so we'd like to just start in D. Little book, yes, 78. Mm. It's easy. Yeah. Oh, okay, here we go.
guitarist song because it says bind us together with guitar chords that Record. cannot be broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. Sorry, we keep forgetting to tell you the key we're in. For D. Those who are playing along. We do a lot of stuff in D. Yeah. 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 Some and people I've call us the A guitar. team, but we really do it in D. <laughs> F, G, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. <laughs> and I've seen a lot of people saying, oh, I'm playing along with my violin, I'm playing along with my trumpet mm, right. tonight. Yeah, great. So cool. a lot of people awesome. out there playing along. Excellent. That's great. So cool. Welcome to the orchestra. Yes. 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 yes, Mel, I did oh, see that. Yes, that's a nice one. That's, that's a nice one. I did see that kick over the thousand, and I tell you, I'm sure it's only ever kicked over the thousand views at one any one time when the pear trees, trees are when the pear oh, trees yeah. are feeding. Everybody yeah, loves right. the pear trees, myself included. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they were yeah. yeah. great. Oh, they yeah. were just such a they were yeah. blessing. Mm. Yep. Top yeah. Yeah. Family goals, mm. yeah. <laughs> you know, mm. having your yeah. mum, dad, and, and the kids just singing or just the way that he loves. Did we do the one? Mm. Got some music here. The way that he loves is number fifteen in the blue book. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it in D, D again. Okay. Yeah. D. Right. Mm. Right. What do I have at fifteen? It's oh, you can have a text one. Oh. <laughs> I see Sparrow and maybe a lot of others are requesting uh -huh. Kumbaya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've only ever done it once your style with Christina Joe. So maybe you could take the lead. 
can teach them and that way. We've got enough girls and guys. Oh, oh right. Oh, so, okay, sorry. Yeah. Acapella. Acapella. Mm. Uh, no Shock guitar. Off. You've got to sing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to. Oh. <laughs> put in yeah, another yeah. 20 cents to work. The leader's going to put you to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay, guys, you ready? Yeah. So, so guys, are you ready? Do whatever she's teaching. Guys, here we go. Um, so... Kum, okay, mm -hmm. See, Kum 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 and again. Kum 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 Sorry, Zimbabweans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we ruined it. We murdered it. You did it. great. <laughs> That's so yeah. lovely. Yeah. Mm. And I've just mm. taken it everywhere I go. Alita mm. was the one who first taught me. So I was like, yes, it's a great it's anticipative great. Yeah. You know, song for mm. congregations. Someone said, um, this brings back memories of Big Camp 2019. Oh, we did it at Big Camp. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, true, true. Yeah. In the Big Camp. So, you came. Did I do it? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I did it, yeah. <laughs> you led it. <laughs> we saved it till yeah, you got yeah, there. Yeah, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. So guys, since we're having so much fun and we're 23 minutes over time oh, already, yeah. oh, what should we do best. to make yeah, it go even pass. longer? <laughs> <laughs> um, pass it on, someone pass requested earlier. Pass it on. We usually <laughs> yeah. try yeah. to stop around about... We, we, we anchor up at about an hour and then we finish about 20 minutes later. Right, right. <laughs> right. This ship's taking a long time to stop. To we're not good on time management. <laughs> but I will say that Phil, who travels the furthest to come whenever this crew get together, was the one who said, I don't mind going for the full hour and a half. Coming all this way only once every so many weeks yeah. might get worth it. Yeah, so absolutely. If I right. doesn't love. And I don't I charge any extra. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, so what was that one? Um, what did you ask? takes a spark, let people pass it on. Oh, is that the same song? Oh, yeah, yeah. Pass it on, yeah. yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everyone. We're going to ask you to find your seats this morning and uh, prepare for our song service time. Friends, we're going to begin and we're asking that everyone will find your seat as we begin our we're asking that everyone find their seat as we begin our time of worship and as we, we begin our time of worship and praising God through song, asking you to find your seats. And uh, uh, those of you, if you have just one seat between you, if you could squeeze together, we've got quite a few people who are coming in to make sure there are no vacant seats. All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the Sabbath, truly the best day of the week. And I pray as we worship you, that the songs that we sing will be mingled with Christ's precious, precious righteousness to ascend to you as a sweet savor. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. So this morning we're going to start. Oh, Where's our pianist? Janet. Janet, we need. Oh, some... here he comes. Here he goes. Oh, okay. Right here. <laughs> Mr. Kelly. I was like. So while our pianist is coming to, to, to his position. Uh, we're going to start our song service with Jesus is all the world to me. But we want to do it in a special way this morning. And perhaps if, if I give uh, 60 seconds for those who are needing their seat to find it quickly and quietly so everyone can hear the instructions. Okay, so up, you have the words up on the screen, and we are going to sing this song in call and response. 
call and response. So I'm going to divide the auditorium in, in half. So over here, you are going to sing with Tara and Julie. And over here, so the dividing line is this young lady here. Going back from this young lady right here, all the way back, this side, you will sing with these ladies on this song. And all the way over here, you will sing with us. If you don't know what call and response is, it is the traditional way that the people of African descent would sing uh, songs as they worked. We did not work this week, but we certainly had a good time together. And call and response was a way to keep each other's spirits and strength and happiness going. And that's what we want to do for each other. We want to keep that commitment and that camaraderie and that brother and sisterliness going, even when we leave here. So when you leave, remember how we sang, Jesus is all the world to me. Okay? Amen. So here's an example. Here's an example for those who don't know. Okay, Gary, we're going to sing, and then you, we're just going to do this first verse. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Two, three. Go for it. You go to, With yeah. The piano. With oh. piano. is all the world to me my life my joy my all he is my strength from day to day without him i would fall you got it you got it okay we're gonna start over <laughs> we're gonna start over all right Sing, sing really, really well over here, okay? <laughs> okay, let's go.
Next song is I Need Thee Every Hour. How many of you need Jesus every hour? Praise God. The more dependent we are on him, the better it is. I need thee every hour. So let's sing this with pathos. Holy, holy is what the angels sing. Who knows this song? A few people. 
A few years ago, I uh, sang this song. I was leading the song service here, and I, I taught a few people in the, co uh, the uh, congregation this song. And ever since, uh, there's someone here, Penny Sharp, I don't know if she's here, but every time I'm leading song service, she wants us to sing this song. <laughs> and I also taught this song to my pastor, right? So today, we're going to sing this song. I was taught this song many, many years ago by my grandmother, who really could not read and write until she was about 60, but learned to read by reading the Bible, and could not sing to save her life, but knew almost every song in the hymnal. And so through her, I have learned, I don't know, 90% of the songs in the hymnal, and so I share them and my, joy, and my love with them with you. So there is singing up in heaven. On the last chorus, we're going to sing the song, and then we're going to repeat the last chorus together a cappella. Okay? Go ahead.
So I want to invite you to stand with us as we sing Love Lifted Me, Love Lifted Me.
Wow. Isn't worship fun? Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. I want to welcome you all this morning to our worship service, and I want to bid you all a very happy Sabbath. We have had such a blessed week, and it's a shame that this is our final day of camp meeting, our final day. But it's the Sabbath, and it's going to be the best Sabbath of this camp meeting. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So I've got a few announcements to share with you, and then Pastor Dave Miller, our president, is going to share a few announcements, and then I will go through the, uh, um, uh, um, the role, how we're going to go through the program, and it will be unannounced there forward. All right? So um, at 2.30 p.m., at 2.30 p.m., uh, I am asking um, that the baptismal candidates from Halifax, Woodside, and Dartmouth, so at 2.30, if you can meet me in the back of the auditorium here at 2.30 p.m., and also at 2.45 p.m., so 15 minutes later, all the baptismal candidates are asked to be in the auditorium dressed and ready. All right? Is that clear for everyone? Yes? No? Okay. All right. So, so 2.30, I'm asking those from, who are going to be baptized into Dartmouth, Halifax, and Woodside to meet me in the back of the auditorium dressed and ready. And uh, those for, for all the baptismal candidates to be here at 245. At, so, and at 3 p.m. promptly, we will be having our evangelism baptism hour. Amen? Amen. Ooh, that was weak. Mercy. <laughs> Can I say that again? I think I need to say that again. This is why we're here, friends. This is all about evangelism. Oh, folks. You're, you're tired. You're tired. That's all right. I'm going to give you a pass. At 3 p.m., we are going to be having our evangelism baptism hour. So we want you to be, amen. Praise the Lord. So we want you to be here supporting our baptismal candidates in prayer. It's going to be a solemn, powerful moment. We're going to go from three to as close to four. Where's Kevin? As close to four as possible because at 4 p.m., we are going to be blessed with a wonderful concert from Magnify and Eastern Hope. Amen? Amen. 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 And I just want to give a little plug. It's really been a burden on my heart. Um, I want to encourage the people of God to sign up for a course offered by Four Seasons of Reconciliation where you will learn about the plight of our indigenous people and how we, as God's people, Seventh-day Adventists, can help them through what they're facing, all right? So just Google it, Four Seasons of Reconciliation. God is counting on us. Pastor Dave? Okay. okay, one more uh, little tidbit. Um, so we're going to be meeting here at 3 p.m., and we're going to be here for roughly 20 minutes, and then we're going to go down towards the beach. Amen. We're going to go down towards the beach, and the baptism will be in the ocean. Okay. We just won't want people to go to the wrong place, right? Yeah. All right. Um, now, some of you saw this the other night, right? It's, it's, actually, it's actually one of the most incredible things that I came across in recent years. For those of you who are not aware of it, right here is the whole book of the Great Controversy. Right here is the whole book of Steps to Christ. And right here is the whole book of the Desire of Ages. Okay? They can do that because on the back there's a QR code. And I think if you uh, take your phones, if you have a QR reader on your phone, you should even be able to pull it off of the screen right now. 
This one here is The Desire of Ages. This is one of my all-time favorite books. I don't even know how many times I've read through this book. The benefit of these things is you can carry them with you in your pocket. You can carry 50 of them in your pocket. When you meet people, you can share the book with them. You didn't have to cut down a forest to do it. You had it with you easily, and it's very easy to use. The other thing of it is that when you do this, where it takes you to, say it's somebody that has a hard time reading, but they've got a smartphone. It also is an audiobook, so they can listen to it instead. Now, I have brought a few of these. I've got them on the table. I would encourage you to pick some up. Please make sure you, you, know, you only take like maybe three of them because as many people as we have here, we want to make sure that everybody has a chance. I've got enough for probably about three of them for each of you that are in here. And if you need more, please contact me and I will get you in touch with your pastor or you know, contact your pastor and have your pastor get in touch with me and I will make sure that, that you guys get the resources to download, to get these business cards. Um, not only it has the full Conflict of the Ages series, in, in total there's probably about 12 to, there's probably around 12 books in there. Um, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, um, can't even remember all of them, but it, it's just absolutely marvelous the way that technology allows us to carry these books with us at all times now. So please, please, make sure you take a couple of them. Contact your pastor, and your pastor will get in touch with me, and I will share with them how they can go ahead and, and order some more. The other thing that I would really like to ask you, and please, I know some of you are not going to be excited about this, but please, it, I, okay, I thought of it, so I think it's a really cool idea, okay? Um, as soon as this is over, very quickly... And we don't want to waste a lot of time at lunch or anything like that. Very quickly, I think we want to go in front of the cafeteria. Evaldo, the guy that, that spoke to you on communications yesterday, he actually has his drone here. We're going to have the youth come out. Everybody, we're trying to get a group shot of absolutely everybody that's here so that we can document this. So please, as soon as, you, as soon as we get done, make your way. We're going to have to get somewhat tight, but not too tight. And uh, Evaldo is, knows to have his drone ready to, to launch it so that we can get a group picture of all of us that were here today. So thank you very much. Blessings and happy Sabbath. Right after this. All right, so our order of service will be the call to worship, which I will share. Then we will have the invocation by Pastor Mike Tucker. Then we will have a special selection by the Tantalan Youth Choir. Then we will have scripture reading by Ben Macbeth. Then we'll have another uh, special music by Oratili Mohai. Then we'll have the offertory by our conference treasurer, Basingi Gatare. Then we will have our pastoral prayer by Jacinth Butterfield. Then our message of the hour uh, by Mike Tucker. All right, so I'm going to ask you that you all rise with me as we open up our call to worship. And I'm reading from the book of Psalms, reading from the book of Psalms. Blessed be the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for warfare. He is my faithful love and my fortress. He is my stronghold and my deliverer. He is my shield and I take refuge in him. He subdues my people under me. Lord, what are humans? that you care for them, or the son of humans that you think of them. We are like a breath. Our days are like a passing shadow. Our service is now called to order.
Please pray with me. Almighty God, we come into your presence today, Lord, because you've called us here. You've asked us to be here. Your spirit has spoken to our hearts, and we have gathered together as one body for that purpose, the purpose of honoring you, worshiping you, and drawing closer to you. We do so, Lord, asking for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that he will rest upon our hearts and our minds. Uh, prepare us for this hour, Lord, so that we might catch a vision of who you are and we might worship you in heart and mind and spirit. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we give glory to your name, for we do it in the name of your dear Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Testing. I am on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is the Tantalan Youth Choir. Aren't they beautiful? Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, we've been singing together for about a, a little over a year, and um, they have been such a blessing. They, we, uh, at our church, what we've been doing is every so often, I think it's once a quarter, we try to have a youth day where the youth take full control of the service. And so this is a result of us coming together, and we pray that you will enjoy and be encouraged by this song this morning that we're going to sing. Surrounded by the fortress stone Right away When all the storms of life are raging Hold on Hold on Hold on You gotta hold on to the rock You got to hold Hold on to the rock of ages Hold on to the cornerstone You gotta stand Strong on the shore foundation, surrounded by the fortress strong. And when, when all the storms of life are raging, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. you gotta hold, hold on to the rock. You know that it doesn't on, take a mighty earthquake on, to shake the on, ground you, you stand on. on. Cause a life can hold change on. like a hurricane And blow hold all the plans on. you planned on. on Well, the ground is gonna hold shake on. And the wind is gonna hold blow on. Who are you gonna trust and where you gonna go? You gotta hold on to the rock of ages Hold on to the cornerstone You gotta stand Strong on the shore foundation, surrounded by the fortress strong. And when, when all the storms of life are raging, hold on, hold on, hold on, you gotta hold on to the rock. You know sometimes when a life is easy, it's so easy to keep the faith. To be grateful for every blessing, when every blessing. 
seed oh, comes your way. When life shakes us to our very soul, who you gotta trust and where you gonna go? You gotta hope. Hold on to the rock of ages. Hope. Hold on to the cornerstone. You gotta stand, stand strong on the sure foundation. Sir. Surrounded by the fortress strong. And when, when all the storms of life are raging. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. <laughs> Who is the rock? Jesus. Amen. Hold on to the rock. It's uh, wonderful to be here at Camp Meeting 2022. And those of you who have been here all week, we know that it has really been a blessing. Um, I'm, my name is Jacinth Butterfield. I'm from the Dartmouth Church, and I am actually doing the scripture reading. Uh, we're going to stand together, and our scripture reading is from St. John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. And I'll read in your hearing. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall, not, shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. Be seated, Amen. please. Good morning, God's children. It's so wonderful to see each and every one of you. I remember it's been over 20 years ago when I, I attended this wonderful meeting that we have year after year. And it's such a privilege to be here again after all these years. And it's so good to see each one of you. Um, that was a beautiful song, and I really enjoyed it. How many of you have enjoyed your time here in Pagwash? I truly, I have enjoyed. I want to do something that probably we haven't done. I know we have several churches here. I'm going to call, who are from Halifax? I see some of you. Who are from Pagwash? I see one hand over there. We are already at your home. <laughs> who are from Moncton? Dieppe, um, Miramichi, which one is the furthest? Bathurst, P.I. There, it's so good to see each one of you. I know there are many others that I did not mention, but forgive me, but I, I just want to speed up. So it's time for us to worship by offering. Today's offering is for... Um, Maritime evangelism. This is very, very important offering. So please dig deep in your pocket. Let's have a word of prayer. A loving Father in heaven, we know that you don't need our money, but we know that it's all yours. So Father, as you are about to return what is yours, we ask that you will bless it, multiply it, 
so that it will further your work in this vineyard. Bless those who have something to give and bless those who don't have anything to give. Above all, God, may we give our hearts to you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's time for our pastoral prayer, so I'll invite you to bow your heads with me, or if you feel like you'd like to, you can kneel, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. I know the floors are hard, so uh, please just join with me in prayer as we, we seek the Lord this morning. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we give praise to you today because you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. Lord, you are our creator, and you are our redeemer. You're the Lord who spoke to us of old. Lord, you're the, we pray to you as the God of the burning bush. We pray to you as the God of, who parted the sea for the Israelites. We pray to you, Lord, as the still small voice that guides us in our quiet moments. Heavenly Father, we pray to you as the Son who gives us the water of life with which we can drink and never thirst again. We pray to you as the Son who gives us the manna from heaven that we may eat thereof and not die. Heavenly Father, you have given us everything we need for life, and we give praise to you, Lord. We, we pray, Lord, that, that your name would be glorified in all the earth, and that this camp meeting and that each one here would play their part in lifting up your name and glorifying it in our communities all across the Maritimes and from every corner of this country and from the U.S. where, where we have come to worship here today. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that your will would be done on this earth that's full of conflict and hunger and war as we listen to this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that your will would be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, there is so much war and injustice, Lord, that we pray and we cry out that you would judge the evil that is being done on this earth. Lord, that men may know that there is a God who judges the earth. Lord, look down and judge the wickedness of men who prosecute war and who oppress the weak. We pray, dear Father, that you would judge those who bring war and death and destruction across our earth. We pray, dear Father, that you would judge those who bring hunger and famine to different parts of the world. Yes, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that, that your will would be done, that you would comfort those who are suffering. Yes. Lord, that your hand of mercy 
and of grace and love would reach out to those who have lost fathers and brothers, to those who are suffering from hunger and disease. Heavenly Father, we pray that your will would be done and that your compassion and, and that your love would stretch to every corner of the world to, to bring your, your compassion and mercy to these situations. Heavenly Father, we pray for the needs of this congregation and this conference today. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would hear the prayers of each one here tonight, or this morning, who, who prays in the night for their loved ones who have wandered away. Lord, there are so many who could be here today. We could be five times, ten times this number if every one of our family who has wandered away were still here. And Lord, you know the prayers of the hearts of everyone who's praying for a lost son or daughter or parent or grandparent or friend or coworker who's wandered away from you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would hear those prayers and draw back our wandering ones. Lord, fill our churches with those who have wandered away. Lord, please bring them back. I pray, dear Father, for those who are hurt this morning, who are suffering from any kind of disease or sickness, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would be the one who heals all our diseases and that you would touch the hearts and the bodies of each person here who's suffering. Lord, we've had special prayer that each time, a couple times this week, we pray that you would hear those prayers and heal those diseases. Heavenly Father, we pray for the message this morning, Lord, that your gospel would once again be preached in power and that you would anoint your servant, Mike Tucker. Lord, please fill him with your Holy Spirit that your gospel could be preached once again from this pulpit, that we could hear the, the words of life. Heavenly Father, that beautiful story that you came down into this earth to live with us. Lord, that you tabernacled with us, that you showed us your glory. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive our sins for when you showed us your goodness, we persecuted you and we put you on the cross. And Father, each one of us, Lord, we struggle with sin and we pray, dear Father, that your hand of mercy would touch each one and each one's sins, Lord, as we confess our sins to you, Lord, we pray in your mercy, that you would hear our confession and forgive our sins and heal all of our, our sins, all of our diseases of the heart, Lord. Heavenly Father, we pray that your coming would be soon. Lord, we ask that that great prince who protects us, your people, that Prince Michael, who would stand up soon, Lord, that the delay would be short, that the time yes, remaining would be, that you would tarry no longer, Lord. This earth is groaning. The whole creation groans for the revealing of your sons and daughters. And so we pray, Father, that Michael would stand up. And I pray that for each one here, that you would make us wise, wise to hear your voice and to hear your Holy Spirit speaking to us so that we might shine like the brightness of heaven. And I pray, dear Father, that you would make each one here a soul winner, one that brings many to righteousness that we might shine like the stars forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we ask all this, and we ask that your blessing especially be on those who are committing their lives to you today in baptism. Lord, please give them that assurance in their hearts that they are making a stand for you that will last for eternity, Father. I pray that you would just buttress their hearts and just confirm the decisions that they're making, Lord, knowing that they are devoting their lives to a God of love, whose love stretches to the heavens, whose righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will bless them and bless the remainder of our service. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, thank you for that music, dear. And to the youth choir as well, and to all that has gone on before, I, I really enjoyed the congregational singing, and your, I saw this audience swaying <laughs> during the theme song. I saw it with my own two eyes. You were enjoying worship is what you were doing. Praise God for that, yeah. I, I swayed with you. I even saw some hands go up, wow. That's incredible. I got some help coming up here, haven't I? <laughs> That's all right. The Protestant Reformation is the start of basically what we call the Christian church today, Protestantism, and it was based on five basic premises, five statements that are posted as alone statements, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, Scripture alone. Glory to God alone. Those are the five basic teachings of Protestantism. That's what the Reformation was, was forged with. And from that we have the teaching uh, that again becomes the foundation of the Christian faith and that is righteousness by faith in Christ alone. That's what we've been talking about this entire week is the gospel. That your salvation is not dependent upon your works, it is dependent upon Jesus you trust Him, He completes you, He forgives you, He redeems you, and then He goes the next step, He changes you from the inside out. He justifies you, that's forgiveness. 
He sanctifies you, that's the changed life, and eventually He glorifies you when He takes you to heaven. He removes from you the penalty of sin, justification. He removes you from the, the power of sin, sanctification. He removes you from the presence of sin, glorification when we go to heaven. That's, that's the gospel story. Everything else that we believe fits around that foundation. Everything from the Sabbath to the second coming, the state of the dead, the 2300 days, if it is not grounded and rooted in that basic teaching, we misunderstand it. It's all about that. Today's story helps us understand that this was Jesus' agenda. We find it in John's Gospel, the fourth chapter. I'm intrigued by this story. I love this story. John's Gospel, the fourth chapter. It seems that the disciples of Jesus and the disciples of John, were, um, they were squabbling. Two different ministries were squabbling. That never happens today. Almost. Um, but they were squabbling. And rather than trying to duke it out and figure out who was it, Jesus said, we got work to do. And so he decided to go north from Judea uh, up to Galilee. And, but in order to do that, basically you had, you had the problem of Samaria right between those two. And so either you had to go around Samaria if you didn't want to go through it, and that would take you longer, or the most direct route was right through it. Every pious Jew would take the extra time and go around Samaria so that they would not be defiled by the Gentile Samaritans. They hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated them. They had hated each other for 500 years. And the Samaritans, of course, were Jews who had been left behind, who intermarried with the other races, with the Gentiles, and so now they were viewed as half-breeds. And when the Jews came back after the captivity in Babylon, they would not allow these, this, these half-breeds to help rebuild the country, rebuild the temple. They excluded them. They would not allow them to participate in the temple worship. And so they created their own temple, their own worship. They accepted the first five books of the Bible, the law, but they did not accept the, 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 uh, the prophets or anything else. And so this was a hybrid religion, part Judaism, part paganism. And they fought wars over all of this. They hated each other. If a Jew saw a Samaritan coming down the road, he would cross the street just to make sure that the shadow of the Samaritan did not fall upon him. That's how much they hated each other. They fought wars. The Jews at one point uh, went into Samaria and burned their temple down. And the Samaritans were not strong enough to counteract that, so, but later they got even in another way, just a few years before the birth of Jesus, if I remember my history correctly. They gained entrance into the temple complex on the eve before uh, Passover, and they scattered dead men's bones throughout the temple to make it unpure so that it had to be cleansed by a ceremony, and that meant that they could not celebrate Passover that year. It was just meanness. There was no military advantage to that. Just, just, we hate you, so here, you can't have Passover kind of a thing. Jesus cared nothing for that history. He cared nothing for the prejudice that existed, the hatred between these two people groups. He thought it was ridiculous, and He took His disciples right through Samaria in order to get to Galilee. And and that's when this story takes place. Verse 3, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The sixth hour means that it's noon. And so, as we find out later, he sent the disciples on into town to get some, some food as he sat at the well. Now, wells in, in that part of the world, especially during that time, basically was a hole in the ground that had a capstone on it. And usually the capstone was about five feet across in diameter. Um, it would be raised up 18 to 20 inches, maybe two feet at the most, and provided a platform for people to work on, but it also covered the well so as to keep the dirt from falling in it. And the, there was a small hole right in the middle, so it looked like a donut with a very small hole, uh, through which they would, they would bring the water up with their bucket. But it was small enough to try to keep small children from falling in, which made sense. And so when the women came to the well, they would place their vessels there. And the wells never had a bucket with them. So if you were a traveler, you carried a bucket with you. 
Um, if you lived in the town of Samaria, you had your own bucket. If you're a woman, you came out and, and you would get your water that way. The buckets were usually made of leather. They were, they were shaped and stretched in such a way and then held open with cross sticks at the opening. And so then they could easily be folded, and then you could wrap it up for easy carry. You also had to have a rope as well, by the way. And so travelers carried with them a bucket, a leather bucket with the cross sticks and a rope. That means that someone in Jesus' party had a bucket. He could have easily asked for it to be left if he was thirsty, but they took it with them on into the town, and he sat there on that well awaiting what would happen next. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. This is jolting for anyone from that culture. It was jolting. First of all, that the woman would come to the well at noon. That was jolting enough. Women came early in the morning and then just before sunset. They also came as a group. They came as a group for safety and propriety's sake. They came as a group for fellowship, but they also came as a group because the vessels that they put the water in were heavy. And they would carry them on their head. And it's hard to get one of those things up there. So they would assist each other with that task, putting the, 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 the pot on their head so that they could carry it on in, into town back home. But it was also a time for, for a communication with one another, to, to, to talk and to, to fellowship together. That a woman comes out in the heat of the day signifies that some, for some reason she may not be welcome in the morning or in the evening. For some reason, she wanted to avoid that company. She decided to come by herself. And so usually that was not a woman of great reputation, someone who was persona non grata, so to speak. She came to the well. And when she came, Jesus saw her approaching. The custom was this. If a man was at the well and he saw a woman approaching, what he was supposed to do was to stand without making eye contact with her because you were never to make eye contact with a woman. You would stand and to move at least 20 feet away from the well, signifying it was safe for her to come and do her business there. Once she was through and she would leave, you would notice that with peripheral vision. You wouldn't try to look at her. You would go back and sit down. That was propriety's sake. That's, that's what was expected. Jesus blew the custom away and sat and waited. And the woman thought, hmm, what's up with this? And then he did something very strange. He spoke to her, which obviously seems to imply that he made eye contact with her. He's, he's throwing up away every societal norm that existed in the conversations between men and women. In fact, there were no conversations between men and women. Rabbis would not speak to their wife in public, much less to a woman they did not know, much less to a Gentile woman, a Samaritan woman. They would never do that. But Jesus broke all those customs. Women traveled in the company of the disciples quite often. Women supported the ministry. Jesus had a new role for women at every stage of his ministry. Every stage. He, he saw them as equals. He elevated them. He, he uh, depended upon them. They were a part of his company, and he respected them. This woman comes. Jesus stays. He makes eye contact. And he speaks to her. But not only does he speak to her, but he, what he says is also jolting. He asks for a drink of water. Jesus is a missionary. Usually when we go as missionaries, we come in with technology. We come in with a hospital, a school. We come in with, you know, slide projectors and, and video and all sorts of things. We blow the area apart, you know, because we, and, and if we establish a school and a hospital, we become employers. We got money. And so that puts us in a superior level giving to the community, and puts them subservient to us quite often. Jesus entered in and he told the disciples to go without a purse. Don't take a second cloak. Make yourself need help from the people you're going to minister to. Jesus could have easily brought with him everything he needed, but instead he asked for a favor from this woman, thus elevating her. She has resources that he's in need of. It's a different way from the fact we've called this different. And so, but he was willing to do that. He was willing to allow her to use her Gentile bucket and pour it up and take a drink. And if she's got a glass or something, a cup, then he was willing to drink from that vessel and to accept help from a Gentile. That was jolting. It had blown aside the societal norms. It had made everything else seem strange and probably put the woman off her game a little bit. 
Because here's this man saying, could you help me? I'm thirsty. And yes, I'm a Jew, you're a Samaritan, but I will drink from your vessel. You have resources that I could use. For his disciples, verse 8, as, after he's asked for this drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9, therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. In the original language, she actually says woman twice. She says, for I'm a woman, a Samaritan woman, now, some have implied something by that, saying that she was there for other reasons, practicing what is referred to pejoratively as the world's oldest profession, that she was looking for a customer. Perhaps that is true. Perhaps it is not. We don't know. That's, that's speculation. But she did make point of the fact that you're speaking to me, a woman, a Samaritan woman, and you're asking me for a drink. How is it that you do that since you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan? So she makes note of the customs and uh, his, his decision to ignore the customs. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Again, there's more packed into that little verse than what you think. The gift of God. The Samaritans thought the gift of God were the first five books of the Bible the Torah. The Jews thought the gift of God were all of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, all of the Old Testament. Muslims think the, the gift of God is the Quran, always a book. Jesus says it's not a book. <laughs> it's me. I am the gift of God. It's not a book. We're thankful for the book. We don't worship the book. <laughs> we worship the God of the book. And Jesus says, I am God's gift to you. Now, that sounds rather egotistical if I were to say that. If I would say to my wife, I'm God's gift to you, I, I hesitate to think what would come out of her mouth. <laughs> so so I, I, I'm a smart man, and I don't say that. I, I try not to act like it either. But when Jesus said this, there's reality there. He was not boasting, he was not bragging, he was not egotistical, he was speaking to the woman about life. This is life. And he talked about living water, living water. The Old Testament refers to God as the source of living water. And now Jesus is declaring himself to be the source of that living water. Water is essential for life, but there's a water that satisfies more deeply than any water you've ever had before. You drink this water you never thirst again. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Again, it may not appear to us on the surface what she's doing, but actually at this point she's being a little sarcastic and she's picking a fight <laughs> because she's going to politics. Folks, please, I, I love you. You're, you're Christians. If you've got politics, vote and then shut up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, but in, in the United States, uh, when I go to Facebook pages of Christians, I see political fights going on between Christians. And I'm wondering, do either of you think that in the, uh, my country, the Democrats or the Republicans actually have answers? They don't. And, you know, you may, you may side with one side more than the other. That's fine. Vote your conscience and move on. But the answer comes from Jesus, not politics. Amen. Now, I'm not going to speak to Canadian politics because I'm an idiot about those. Uh, I try to be uh, an idiot about U.S. politics, but it's hard to avoid it all, you know. And it's just ugly. And right now, I think it's uglier than it's been in a long time. And so the woman is actually picking a political fight. You don't think you're greater than Abraham who gave us this land and this well? All right, now, every normal Jew would look at her and say, you half-breed, how dare you say that Abraham gave you this well, that Jacob gave you this well? This is ridiculous. 
He gave the well to us, the Jews, not you half-breeds. And the fact that you are in possession of it now means that you are, you are in possession of something that does not belong to you. You are stealing it. You're stealing the water in it. That's the, the political discussion that would take place. Jesus didn't care about the politics. He was not going to be sucked into a political discussion. He was not going to allow that to distract him from the core, which was himself. It is the gospel. He wanted to bring life to this woman, not political expediency. He didn't want to convert her to a particular political party. I see Christians saying, if you're a Democrat, you surely can't be a Christian. And Christians saying, if you're a Republican, there's no way you can be a Christian. Uh, Jesus wasn't going to go there. He said, I don't care about the political infightings between the Jews and the Samaritans. And so his answer demonstrated that. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. He just ignored it. He wouldn't be drawn into the political fight. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. He left the politics. He said, I'm not even going there. No sense even referencing it. Let's go back to the core, to the thing that matters. You drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Some have made a lot of the fact that it seems here that she's talking about her religion as a, uh, religion is kind of a, um, she's a consumer. I kind of like that about your religion. I might purchase that. You know, I'm, I'm selecting here back and forth. And again, Jesus is going to ignore that. It's not what he's interested in. And so he decides he's going to cut to the quick. Now, this next thing that he does, I think, uh, personally, I think is misunderstood. Uh, it flies in the face of what a lot of commentators say. I've got a different take on this. Listen to see if you don't think that maybe there's some validity to what I say, and if I'm wrong, it's all right. I've been wrong before. Verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. A lot of commentators say that now he's going to point out her sin. Let's wait. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you, you have said truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, there's an understatement. But here's what I think. I don't think that Jesus is pointing out her sin. And the reason I don't think that is because in that day, no woman could file for divorce. She had never filed for divorce. Men enacted divorces. The only place in the ancient world where at times a woman could file for a divorce was Rome itself. These were not Romans. And in that culture, no woman could file for divorce. And the divorces that were enacted against her, I'm going to say were not for adultery because the penalty for adultery was not divorce, it was death. And if this woman had been adulterous, certainly once or if she'd been an adulterous one, why would, why would the next man marry her? In that culture, shame avoidance, unlikely, unlikely. And five times, surely someone would have killed her. And even though death penalties had to be enacted by Rome, this was a woman in a small village. Who would notice? What Roman official is going to be watching? The honor killings are still something that happened in the East. Still happen in the East, even though it's against the law. You tell me that they wouldn't do it there? If this had been an adulterous woman, someone would have killed her by now, and certainly she would not have been married five times. I don't think Jesus was pointing out her sin. I think he was pointing out her pain. Five men had promised to love, honor, and cherish till death do you part, and five men had backed out. Five men had taken her and used her, and five men had rejected her. Five men had promised to protect her and to, to provide for her, and five men dumped her. Jesus was pointing to her pain. He was speaking to her pain, not her sin. And after five men, she gave up on the promises. 
Someone who was willing to give her shelter, I'll take it because the promise doesn't mean anything in any way. And that was number six. May not excuse it, but certainly it explains it, doesn't it? I've never been through a divorce. I've lost a spouse through death. That was the most painful thing I've ever gone through. But there's an element contained in a divorce that I never experienced in my grief. Elements. And a divorce is a sense of failure, a sense of rejection, a sense that in somehow you are substandard. There's societal pressures and societal rejections of you, and sometimes the church does the same thing. And sometimes the church figures we got to find a guilty party and punish someone. Yeah, am, am I making sense to you? And again, we come back to what I mentioned last night, that the Christian army seems to be the only army on earth that tends to shoot its wounded. When those are individuals who are wounded, Jesus, I think, was not condemning the woman. He was speaking to the pain that was hers. And when He spoke to that area of pain, to that point of pain, He had her attention. So I perceive that you are indeed a prophet. Now she, this gets a little too intimate for her. It's a little too close. She's too nervous, man, because when you suddenly are made that vulnerable, that vulnerable, what do you do? Where do you go now? And so this is frightening to her, and so she tries to find distance again, and she does it in the safest place she knows, and that is theology. <laughs> Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. I find that people find it easier to argue over doctrine than they do to be vulnerable before the living God and to know Him personally. We're more interested at times in being right than we are in being known by and loved by the God of heaven. I, as a young pastor, I used to pray that someone would ask me to explain a doctrinal point to them because I knew how to do that. But when they would ask me, how do I know Jesus? How do I get to, do I fall in love with Him? How do I grow in Him? I didn't know what to say. It was frightening to me. Recognizing my own vulnerability then, I made a personal study of it. I'm not frightened by that anymore. I'm not frightened by it. But the way to avoid vulnerability is to talk about points of doctrine, it is to talk about behaviors. And whether this is right behavior in these circumstances or not, because that's clinical, it's out there, and it doesn't reveal me to anyone. You want to see the most spiritual people I know as people who go to an AA meeting. Hello, my name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Joe. I've been sober for four days. Applaud. Applaud. What would it be if church was like that? What would it be? But some of us are afraid to share with anyone that we're a sinner when we go to church. Shouldn't church be the place where it is understood and accepted and we love each other? Hello, my name is Mike and I'm a sinner. Hi, Mike. <laughs> it's been about 30 minutes since my last sin, but I just was proud of that, so we're starting again. <laughs> Come on. Is that not church? That's church, right? And then applause, all right. At least you know who you are. We're here. We love you. We support you. This should be the place where we are safe, where we are safe. I'm struggling with this. Pray for me. We'll love you. We're going to stand by your side. We're not going to judge you. We are God's children, and we all struggle with something. That's what God wants in His church. That's who we are to be. Now, this woman wasn't ready for that. She was frightened by it because she'd been judged too often. She'd been rejected too often. And so she goes to worship. And she goes, to, uh, yeah, theology, the worship wars. We still have those. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus' response here is just, oh, man. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. The place is irrelevant. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And he's pointing again to himself. This is not an argument. It's from the Jews. That's me. But an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. 
For such people the Father seeks to be His true worshipers. Spirit and truth. Sometimes there's a tendency, especially for conservative denominations, to focus more on truth than we do on spirit. Uh, we, we make a big, a big uh, deal about having the truth, and I believe we do. However, the interesting thing is that Jesus told us what truth is and is not t the 28 fundamental beliefs. He said, I am the truth. So if we say we have the truth, we better mean we have Jesus. And these other little doctrines that we call truth are actually truth, uh, little letter T, who points to capital letter T, truth, Jesus Christ. Their only value is that they reveal to us the character of God as seen through Jesus Christ. They're important, but only because they point us to the one who himself is truth. That's their value. That's their value. So we, but we worship in truth, but we should also worship in spirit. That's why it just did my heart so much good to see you swaying. <laughs> it did my heart so much good to see that there's a, a spirit of love and joy in your heart for the one who died for us. We've got something to sing about. It's been said that the Christian religion is the only religion with a hymnal. That's because we're the only ones with something to sing about. <laughs> we sing because we love Jesus. There's reason for joy and rejoicing because we love our Savior. Spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. The Samaritans viewed that the Messiah was coming, but he was not a savior from sin or a conqueror. He was a great teacher who would reveal truth to them, reveal great things to them. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And in the original language, he actually says the Greek version of I am. He refers to himself as I am, I am, which is the name for God. At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said to him, what do you seek or why do you speak to her? You see, the disciples came and Jesus was supposed to be speaking to a woman. And the, the thing, what do you seek, is a euphemism for get out of here, you know, you want us to get rid of her? Um, and, and, but they're thinking, well, maybe he doesn't want us to get rid of her. And then to ask, why are you speaking to her? It seems to put the, the students on the level of the teacher confronting him with his obvious sin of speaking to a woman. They weren't able to do that, so they said nothing, and it was awkward. <laughs> no one could say anything to each other. They stood there, the woman finally felt their presence, and then she went to do something that Jesus told her to do which in that culture she shouldn't be able to do. He said, go, call your husband, and bring him here. She was to go find the man, instruct him, give him directions, and lead him. No woman was supposed to do that in that culture. But Jesus said, go do it. So she leaves. So the woman left her water pot, which means she's coming back, and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done this is not the Christ, is it? So they went out of the city and were coming to him. She didn't just do this to one man. She brought the whole village. No one would think she could bring a man. She Forget just one man. That's not enough. She, she becomes the first woman preacher. She brought a village to Jesus. She brought a village to Jesus. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to each other, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields that they are white for harvest. Harvest time, plowing time, plowing time and seed sowing time was September. Harvest time was April and May depending on which grain you were harvesting and which crop you were harvesting. And so there would be this, this season in between. But Jesus said the time is coming when, as we see right here, verse 36, already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for the eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. The suggestion is the time is coming when the seed will be so ready to spring up that as soon as the plowers and sowers do their work, right behind them needs to come the reapers because it's not only grown, it's ripe and ready to be picked. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. 
Uh, yet I, I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have not entered into their labor. Verse 39, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two more days. That meant that the disciples had to sleep in Samaritan beds, eat from Samaritan table, uh, 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 plates, use Amer Samaritan utensils, drink from Samaritan cups, and they just thought, what has happened to our world? You talk about uncomfortable. Two days of doing that. What is, what is our teacher doing to us? Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this was coming to my office early one morning, and I looked on my calendar, and I had two appointments besides my regular visitation in hospital patients. In the morning, I had an appointment with a woman who had previously been a patient in our hospital, so I knew she was 28 years old. In the afternoon, I was to walk across the street to visit another woman in a nursing home who was 78 years old. I made note of the fact that these two women were separated in age by exactly one half a century. That was interesting. So the morning came, and finally the, the young woman came. She was an attractive young woman, but obviously very nervous to be there, awkward, and she sat down. We made small talk for a while, and finally she got to the point. Chaplain, she said, I'm 28, and I've been married and divorced four times. All four divorces were my fault. I have numerous affairs and I've broken up countless marriages. Because of that, my children have been taken from me. I don't see them very often. My family doesn't speak to me. I'm pretty much alone in the world. I'm wondering, is there any hope for a woman like me? That afternoon, I walked across the street and sat down at the bedside of a woman who was 78 years old who was dying of cancer. She did not waste time with small talk. She had been a successful businesswoman, had traveled the world. She came right to the point. Chaplain, I've been married and divorced five times. All five divorces were my fault. I've had numerous affairs. I've broken up countless marriages. My family won't speak to me. My children won't. I have one niece who every now and then will come by and visit with me briefly. Otherwise, I'm alone in the world. Tell me, Chaplain, is there any hope for a woman like me. Two women on the same day, separated in age by 50 years, same problem, same question, same answer, Jesus. Because the one who has died for you is available for you. Turn to Him. Turn to Him. He has found you. The fact that you're even asking the question means He has found you. Turn to Him. He will redeem.
Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank You for the lessons that we've learned today. We thank You that we have seen another fresh vision of Your love, Your grace, Your tenderness, Your compassion. We've also seen that You are indeed searching for each one of us. In fact, have found us, and all that remains is for us to accept that and to turn to You. So today, Lord, we do that. We receive You as Lord and Savior, receiving the forgiveness for our sins. We pledge by Your grace to live in You, to grow in You, and to share this love with those around us. Thank You, Lord, for this life, for a life of meaning and purpose. Thank You for direction and for joy. And now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. going to take a picture right in front of the cafeteria. Would please, well, let's get together. <laughs>